Part 1 You will hear a conversation between Annetta and Charlotte, first-year university students, and Bill, who works for the Student Union Employment Service. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Hi Bill, this is my friend Charlotte. She's doing first year science too. Pleased to meet you Charlotte. Annetta told me you want some part time work. Now, I just have to complete your details on the computer. Um, what's your surname? Johnston. With an E? Yes, J-O-H-N-S-T-O-N-E. I know that you live in the Heathfield Street student residence, but I can't remember the street number there. It's 126. 126. Good. And the phone number? Well, actually, I never give people that number because sometimes nobody answers or they forget to pass on the messages. So, I bought a mobile phone yesterday, but I can't remember the number. I think it's 0414... Eight four seven seven four eight. I'll just check. No, sorry, not seven four eight. It's seven four nine. O oh, four one four eight four seven seven four nine. Yes, that's right. I must try and remember it. And what sort of work are you looking for? Well. Anything really, I suppose, though it depends when it is. I'd rather work during the day, if that's possible. How many hours a week were you thinking of? Oh, I'm not sure. Maybe about ten. But I need to keep at least two days a week free for study. Do you have any work experience? Not much, though I used to help in my uncle's shop when I was at school. OK. Well... I'll put it in, but we don't usually get shop work. What about gardening? I'd rather not. Everything I touch dies. What other kinds of work are there? Well, there's a, a lot of demand for house cleaning, fast food preparation and kitchen work and pizza delivery if you've held a driving licence for 12 months. I'm not sure. Can I have a look at the vacancies while you talk to Annetta? Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Bill, I'd like to change my job. You're at the Hamburger Express on the High Street, aren't you? What's the problem? Well, I never know what hours I'm going to work. I start at 7pm and I'm supposed to finish at 11pm, but sometimes they keep me until 2 or 3am. Yes, that is a bit late if you have to make a 9am lecture the next day. And the other thing is the pay. They're supposed to pay me on Thursdays. But they never pay me on the correct day, often not until Friday or Saturday. A few weeks ago, I had to wait until Sunday. They said their son was sick, so they couldn't get to the bank. But they're always making excuses. Yes, that doesn't sound too good. Would you be interested in pizza delivery? You need to have a driving licence. Yes, I've got a licence. But I think I'd like to change from working in the evening. Are there any day jobs available? Well, as I told Charlotte, there are several cleaning and gardening vacancies. Uh, and this childcare job that just came in this morning. Do you like children? Yes, I do, actually. What's the job? Let's have a look. Collect the boy aged four from kindergarten at 3pm. 
pick up the other two girls who are age six and nine from the primary school at 3.15. You take them home and look after them. The parents will be home by seven. That sounds quite good. What about the pay? It's the same as you're earning now, four hours a day, Monday to Friday, so 20 hours a week. You need to contact Mrs. Uh, Alicia Thompson. Her phone number is 91045629 and she lives in Springfield. I've never been to Springfield. I hope I don't get lost. Don't worry. It sounds quite straightforward. Let's have a look at the street directory. The Thompsons live here in Tulip Street, number 252. So you catch the 631 bus, get off here next to the post office in Daisy Terrace. Walk past the post office to the corner and on the opposite corner is the kindergarten. Then walk down Daffodil Place and cross over to the primary school. Then keep going down Daffodil Place to the corner and turn right into Tulip Street. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a talk by a tour guide. First, you will have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Welcome to San Fernando City Tours. I'm Mark, your tour guide. We have a lot to see in three hours, so make sure you're comfortable. We'll be traveling into the historical district first, and then into the town center. After that, it's out to the harbor, and we'll finish up at the lighthouse, just past the harbor. That will take us up to midday, and after that, you're free to do what you want. At the lighthouse, you'll have a chance to visit the tea room and take photographs of the magnificent coastline. Now, as we have only three hours, we won't be able to take you around the shopping district, but we think you'd prefer to look around the shops there in your own time anyway. San Fernando has some well-known tourist attractions, the lighthouse, for example, and the National Library. However, the little-known military museum is not to be missed. Be sure to visit before you leave. Now, there's a lot to do in San Fernando. Indeed, there really is something for everyone. For those who love the water, I can recommend a trip on the Seafarer, one of the most famous boats on the San Fernando River. It does an evening trip with a three-course meal included. It's great fun for everyone, but especially for young people in their teens or twenties. After nine, there's a disco on the boat, and it gets really lively. Then there's a climbing wall near the town center. It's incredibly popular, with a large wall for expert climbers and a smaller wall for novices. There's a junior wall and a creche, so it's a great day out for those of you with kids. And if you like walking, there's some great walking tours. The city sites tour is highly recommended, as is the walking tour by the coast. But that one's only for the fit, not really suitable for children or the elderly. For more mature people, or those less able to get around, I would suggest a tour around the vineyards. It can be done in the luxury of a coach, and it's a wonderful way to explore the region's wines. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. Naturally, there is a charge for all these attractions, but you can get 15% off if you have an Explorer Pass. If you don't have a pass but would like one, the driver here has application forms. Just ask him for one and fill it out while on the tour. Then you hand it into the tour office. Normally, it costs $10, but this year it's just $7. When you hand it in, you'll get your picture taken for the card on the spot, and then your card is ready to use. Remember to show it whenever you pay for anything. The discounts apply not just to tourist attractions, but some bars and restaurants. Basically, everywhere you see a red explorer symbol. Ah, we're coming up to the historical district now. If you'd like to look at That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. You will hear a student called Sandra talking to her now tutor to about eight. a draft proposal she has written for a competition. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Right, Sandra. You wanted to see me to get some feedback on your group's proposal, the one you're submitting for the Geography Society field trip competition. Uh-huh. I've had a look through your proposal, and I think it's a really good choice. <laughs> In fact, I only have a few things to say about it, but even in an outline document like this, you really have to be careful to avoid typos and problems with layout in the proposal, and even in the contents page. So read it through carefully before submitting it, okay? Will do. And I've made a few notes on the proposal about things which could have been better sequenced. Okay. As for the writing itself, I've annotated the proposal as and where I thought it could be improved. Generally speaking, I feel you've often used complex structures and long sentences for the sake of it, and as a consequence, although your paragraphing and inclusion of subheadings help, it's quite hard to follow your train of thought at times. Oh. So cut them down a bit, can you? Really? Yes, and don't forget simple formatting like numbering. Didn't I use page numbers? I didn't mean that. Look... You've remembered to include headers and footers, which is good, but listing ideas clearly is important. Number them or use bullet points, which is even clearer. Then you'll focus the reader on your main points. I thought your suggestion to go to the Navajo Tribal Park was a very good idea. No, oh, I've always wanted to go there. My father was a great fan of cowboy films and the Wild West, so I was subjected to seeing all the epics, <laughs> many of which were shot there. Mm -hmm. As a consequence, it feels very familiar to me, and it's awesome, both geographically and visually. So it's somewhere I've always wanted to visit. The subsequent research I did and the online photographs made me even keener. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30.
Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. Interesting. Right, let's look at the content of your proposal now. Did you find it comprehensive enough? Well, yes and no. You've listed several different topics on your contents page, but I'm not sure they're all relevant. No? Well, I thought that from the perspective of a field trip, one thing I needed to focus on was the sandstone plateau and cliffs themselves. The way they tower up from the flat landscape is just amazing. The fact that the surrounding softer rocks were eroded by wind and rain, leaving these huge outcrops high above the plain. It's hardly surprising that tourists flock to see the area. Well, yes, I'd agree with including those points. And then the fact that it's been home to Native American Navajos and all the social history that goes with that. The hardships they endured trying to save their territory from the invading settlers. Their culture is so rich. All those wonderful stories. Well, I agree it's interesting, but it's not immediately relevant to your proposal, Sandra. So, at this stage, I suggest you focus on other considerations. I think an indication of what the students on the trip could actually do when they get there should be far more central, so that certainly needs to be included and to be expanded upon. And I'd like to see something about the local wildlife and vegetation, too. Not that I imagine there's much to see. Presumably the tourist invasion hasn't helped. Okay, <clears throat> I'll do some work on those two areas as well. But you're right, there's not much apart from some very shallow-rooted species. Although it's cold and snowy there in the winter, the earth is baked so hard in the summer sun that rainwater can't penetrate. Mm -hmm. So it's a case of flood or drought, really. So I understand. Now, before we look at everything in more detail, I've got a few factual questions for you. It would be a good idea to include the answers in your finished proposal, because they're missing from your draft. Fine. So, you mentioned the monoliths and the spires, which was good. But what area does the tribal park cover? Do you know? 12,000 hectares. And the plain is at about 5,850 meters above sea level. Mm, larger than I expected. Okay. Where's the nearest accommodation? That's a practical detail that you haven't included. Have you done any research on that? Yes. There's nowhere to stay in the park itself, but there's an old trading post called Goulding quite near. All kinds of tours start from Goulding, too. What kind of tours? Well, the most popular are in four-wheel drive jeeps, but I wouldn't recommend hiring those. I think the best way to appreciate the area would be to hire horses instead and trek around on those. Biking is not allowed, and it's impossible to drive around the area in private vehicles. The tracks are too rough. Okay. Lastly, what else is worth visiting there? There are several caves, but I haven't looked into any details. I'll find out about them. Okay, good. Now what I'd like to know is more about... That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecturer's introduction to a geography module. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. So, welcome to your introductory geography lecture. We'll begin with some basics. Firstly, what do we learn by studying geography? Well, we learn a great deal about all the processes that have affected and that continue to affect the Earth's surface. But we learn far more than that, because studying geography also informs us about the different kinds of relationships that develop between a particular environment and the people that live there. OK, we like to think of geography as having two main branches. There's the study of the nature of our planet, its physical features, what it actually looks like, and then there's the study of the ways in which we choose to live and of the impact of those on our planet. Our current use of carbon fuels is a good example of that. But there are more specific study areas to consider too, and we'll be looking at each of these in turn throughout the semester. These include biophysical geography, by which I mean the study of the natural environment and all its living things. Then there's topography. That looks at the shapes of the land and oceans. There's the study of political geography and social geography too, of course, which is the study of communities of people. We have economic geography, in which we examine all kinds of resources and their use, agriculture, for example. Next comes historical geography, the understanding of how people and their environments and the ways they interact have changed over a period of time. And urban geography, an aspect I'm particularly interested in, which takes as its focus the location of cities, the services that those cities provide, and migration of people to and from such cities. And lastly, we have cartography. That's the art and science of map making. You'll be doing a lot of that. So, to summarise before we continue, we now have our key answer. Studying this subject is important because without geographical knowledge, we would know very little about our surroundings and we wouldn't be able to identify all the problems that relate to them. So, by definition, we wouldn't be in an informed position to work out how to solve any of them. OK, now for some practicalities. What do geographers actually do? Well, we collect data to begin with. You'll be doing a lot of that on your first field trip. How do we do this? There are several means. We might, for example, conduct a census counter population in a given area, perhaps. We also need images of the Earth's surface, which we can produce by means of computer generation technology or with the help of satellite relays. We've come a very long way from the early exploration of the world by sailing ships when geographers only had pens and paper at their disposal. After we've gathered our information, we must analyse it. We need to look for patterns, most commonly those of causes and consequences. This kind of information helps us to predict and resolve problems that could affect the world we live in. But we don't keep all this information confidential. We then need to publish our findings so that other people can access it and be informed by it. And one way in which this information can be published is in the form of maps. You'll all have used one at some stage of your life already, Let's consider the benefits of maps from a geographer's perspective. Maps can be folded and put in a pocket and can provide a great store of reference when they're collected into an atlas. They can depict the physical features of the entire planet if necessary or just a small part of it in much greater detail. But there is a drawback. You can't exactly replicate something that is three-dimensional, like our planet, on a flat piece of paper because paper has only two dimensions, and that means there'll always be a certain degree of distortion on a map. It can't be avoided. We can also use aerial photographs, pictures taken by cameras at high altitude above the Earth. These are great for showing all kinds of geographical features that are not easy to see from the ground. 
You can easily illustrate areas of diseased trees or how much traffic is on the roads at a given time or information about deep seabeds, for example. Then there are Landsats. These are satellites that circle the Earth and transmit visual information to computers at receiving stations. They circle the Earth several times a day and can provide a mass of information. You'll all be familiar with the information they give us about the weather, for example. So, what we're going to do now is look at a short presentation in which you'll see all these tools... That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.